hi guys welcome back to this channel and in this video i'm going to talk about how to write chapter 3 of your phd thesis proposal in chapter 3 in this case and in most programs refers to the research methodology chapters so what role does chapter 3 play chapter 3 basically details how the student is going to go about conducting his study and answering your research questions or achieving your research objectives And before I go uh, deeper into the sections of chapter three, I wanted to briefly touch on the research philosophies. And as a PhD student, you are expected to know and to understand the four broad branches of research philosophies. And these include, um, the first one is the ontology. And ontology here refers to the nature of reality. Is your reality externally influenced or does it um, emerge from within and um, under ontology there are three different uh, branches of ontology we have objectivism we have uh, subjectivism and we also have constructivism then the second branch of philosophy research philosophy is the epistemology and epistemology deals with the nature of knowledge and how that knowledge is acquired and under epistemology we also have three categories we have positivism we have inter interpretivism and we also have pragmatism and then the third uh, branch of research philosophy is axiology and this deals with the role of values and ethics in research is your research um, value laden or is it value free and what are the ethical considerations that are applicable to the research that you are planning to conduct and then the fourth and last uh, branch of research philosophy is um, methodology and methodology deals with the methods, tools and strategies that are used to acquire knowledge. Of the four research philosophies, um, ontology and epistemology greatly influence the methodology that um, a student or a researcher is going to adopt. So the first section is um, the introduction to the chapter. This is a short paragraph and informs the reader about what the chapter is going to cover. After the introduction to the chapter, then um, the student is expected to discuss the research method and the research design that he or she is going to adopt. And the research method and design should be guided by the research objectives or the research questions. It can be quantitative, qualitative or mixed methods research method. And under each category of research method, there are specific research designs. So for instance, under the quantitative research method, we have descriptive, we have correlational, and we have experimental research designs, among others. Under qualitative, we have ethnography, we have phenomenological, we have grounded theory, we have case study as um, the research design, um, among others. And under mixed methods, research method, we have um, a number of research designs, including sequential explanatory, sequential exploratory, sequential transformative, and concurrent triangulation designs. And um, each of these research design has its pros and cons. So it is up to the researcher to choose um, which method and which design is applicable to answer his or her research question and to achieve the research objectives. And you should always justify why you have chosen that research method and research design. The third section um, is about the population and the sampling that um, as a student you're going to use. And the population has the entire list of your subjects of interest. Um, in most cases, it is impossible to reach the entire population especially if the elements in that population are, are many or, it's, or if the population is large. So as a result of that, um, you are expected to get a sample from that population. And how you go about choosing a sample is what is referred to as a sampling, sampling procedure. So a sample is a subset of the population of study from which data is going to be collected. And the sample size should be determined a priori, and especially if you're going to use the quantitative research method. But if the population is small, you can the population can also act as your sample. So sampling is a process by which a sample is drawn from a population, 
and there are two broad categories of sampling. Um, these are uh, the random and purposive sampling strategies. So the random sampling is basically used uh, primarily for quantitative studies and here the sample is selected randomly whereby each subject in the population has an equal chance of being selected for the sample. And the advantage of using the ran random sampling technique is that you can be able to generalize your results to, to the entire population. And then the second broad category of sampling is the purposive sampling. And this is used primarily for qualitative studies. And a purposive sampling, the sample is selected deliberately rather than randomly. The sample is selected so that it can be able to, the data collected from the sample can be able to answer the research questions. And a purposive sampling also the subjects do not have an equal chance of being selected for the sample. Then the sample elements are selected just because they are relevant to that study. And as a result, the downside to this is that the results cannot be generalized to the entire population. The fourth section that should go in the methodology chapter is the data collection methods and tools. And there are two broad categories of data type. Uh, we have primary data or secondary data. So primary data is the data that the researcher himself go, goes about collecting. Whereas secondary data is data that already exists, that has been collected by other people. And so the researcher um, gets this data that already exists and uses it to for his own research study. And then we also have um, various data collection methods and tools. And the use of these methods and tools depends on the research, research design that um, the researcher has specified earlier. Under this section also, the student is expected to, to discuss how he's going to go about recording the notes. Is he going to take notes using pen and paper, or is he going to use digital tools such as a mobile phone or tablets? So under data collection methods and tools, we have um, quite a number of them. We have the survey. The survey is used for quantitative studies and here you use a structured questionnaire to collect data. We also have interviews. Interviews are mostly used for qualitative study. You can use um, either a semi-structured interview guide or um, an unstructured questionnaire to conduct your interviews and here you have a mixture of both closed-ended questions as well as open-ended questions. Then we also have focus group discussions, which are also used for qualitative studies. And here, rather than um, conducting interviews from one um, individual, you, 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 you sort of form a group of respondents and then uh, conduct a discussion using that group of respondents. We have observation. Observation is also used uh, primarily in qualitative studies. And here you can use uh, observation protocol to collect the data that you're interested in collecting. We also have document review, which are mostly used um, when you just want to review information that are that already exists in documents. So there are quite a number of uh, data collection methods and tools that a student can use. So once you have discussed your research method, you have discussed your research designs, you have discussed how you're going to go about um, collecting data, the next important section that you need to discuss in your research methodology chapter is the ethical considerations. And these are very important, especially in studies that deal with human subjects. And the ethical considerations will vary from study to study, depending on who or what the units of study are. The ethical considerations will depend on whether the study involves human subjects or organizations, institutions. Also, does the study involve minors and does it involve disadvantaged communities or not? Uh, so these are the um, questions that the student needs to answer before deciding on the ethical considerations that are applicable to his or her study. 
and some of the ethical considerations include um, obtaining ethical clearance and research permit from relevant authorities. I this is very important for any PhD level. Research, it is before you proceed with your data collection, you're supposed to obtain ethical clearance from your university and research permit from any relevant authority. And this depends, of course, on, um, on the country where your study is taking place. And also, it also varies from one institution to another. The other co ethical consideration is informed consent, whereby um, you need to inform your respondents that uh, you're planning to conduct this study and that they have been um, identified as, um, as one of the respondents for the study. So they're supposed to sign a consent form. So as a researcher and as a student, before you go up, before you start your interview, before you start administering your questionnaire, you're supposed to you're supposed to administer a consent form whereby the respondent is supposed to sign before you start your data collection. And then the, th the third ethical consideration is compensation for participants and this varies from one study to another. In some cases, compensation is not allowed, but in other cases, um, it is allowed to compensate your respondents for the time spent in providing you the valuable information. Then you also have confidentiality, whereby the information provided to you by respondents should be confidential, should be used primarily just for your study. Then the other ethical consideration is um, considering the harm versus the benefits to your participants. Um, your study should not harm your respondents at all in any way and it should offer benefits to your participants. So in your introduction letter you're supposed to highlight the potential benefits that the participants are likely to experience by them participating in, in that study. Lastly is the dissemination of findings to participants. So if you promised your participants that you're going to share your findings with them, then make sure you keep that promise and you deliver on it. And then last but not least is the data analysis section. So in this section, you detail how the data collected will be analyzed and um, you're supposed to discuss which data analysis methods and techniques you are going to use. And this will vary depending on the type of data you collected. So for quantitative data, for instance, you're expected to use descriptive statistics as well as inferential analysis techniques, depending also on the research question you, you stated in your chapter one. And then with qualitative data, some of the data analysis um, methods and techniques include content analysis and thematic analysis, among others. And then the, the data analysis procedures should be detailed enough such that any other researcher or student can be able to replicate your study using the same data or using their own data. And lastly, you're also supposed to explain which data analysis software you are going to use for your analysis and provide a justification for why you are planning to use that data analysis software. After discussing the data analysis, then the last section is the chapter summary, uh, which is also a very short paragraph and it summarizes the key points that were covered in the chapter and it is uh, about a paragraph in length. So I hope uh, you have learned one or two things from this video. Um, if you have additional comments or if you have additional points that you want to make, I'd like to hear from you. Let's learn from each other. Thank you for listening. Bye.